uh, us deductors? Uh, I came on a little later than Tony. I, uh, I was finishing up uh, storyboarding on Paranorman, but uh, Tony had been on it much earlier. Yeah, about uh, five years ago I came up to, to visit Leica and Travis gave me the, the Alan Snow book, Here Be Monsters to Read, and then we started development and uh, worked on it with a very small crew until Graham became available off of Paranorman. Mm -hmm. And why did you say to be two directors instead of one? Uh, it's pretty common in animation that <laughs> yeah. there's more than one director. It's, it's pretty much, uh, um, it takes as much as you can give to it, you know, as many directors' uh, time as you have. And Graham was on the story department the whole time, helping to hone down the story because the book is very long and mm -hmm. complicated. So it just seemed like the perfect opportunity to get a partner. Plus, I had never done a stop motion movie before, so it was great to have somebody who had a little bit more experience at the studio here at Leica. What were the challenges of streamlining the, the story for, for this movie? Uh, pretty colossal. <laughs> the, book, the book is amazing. Uh, uh, but part of the big appeal of the book was the, the amount of characters, the amount of uh, locations and things in it. For a film, it just needed to kind of get refined. And Alan Snow packed that book with so many great things. It, was, it, was, it took a long time to sort of decide on what was the right elements to sort of keep and retain and mm -hmm. make it into a, an animated feature. One of the, on the sets of, of, the, of the movie, could you tell us about this one? Uh, a lot of the movie is set, is set in a, a Victorian hill town of Cheesebridge. And uh, one part of the town, the people who live in the town, it's very hierarchical. There's aristocrats who live at the top of the city. And then there's working people who live in the middle. And then there's our hero, Box Trolls, who live beneath the city. And this is part of the foyer or the front room of the Cheese Guild which is the most opulent building in the Market Square at the top of the city, and it's where the leaders of the city meet. Uh, the mayor of the city, uh, Lord Portly Rind, lives here, and he meets with his cronies, this group of aristocrats called the Men in White Hats. And behind me you can see the stairway that leads up to their favorite <laughs> thing to do uh, is to go to the curtatorium, or they call it the tasting room, where they taste all the finest cheeses from all over the world that they're obsessed with. <laughs> uh, not coming from uh, stop motion animation, what did you find when you step into the role of director? Yeah, for <laughs> me, yeah. <laughs> I've been working for about 20 years in animation, and I think I've done every kind of animation there was, but I'd never been in production in stop motion mm -hmm. before. And it's completely different than, than, uh, than any other type of animation. The stresses are different because in most other forms of animation, it's a very slow pace and you can hone a performance in drawings or on the computer and you can test it over and over again. And stop motion animation is much more like a live action movie or a regular movie is that each, each time the animator animates, it's a performance. He really only gets one or two shots to get it right completely and that's it. So it's, it's, it, it's much more gratifying early up because at the end of a week of shooting you get to see what the final <coughs> shot looks like. It doesn't need to be painted or rendered in the computer. But for that week, it's stressful because once the performance begins, there's no way to stop it until the animation <laughs> is done. The look of the movie is very particular. It's, it's kind of like a steampunkish uh, sort of grand opera, Gilbert and Sullivan, 1890 something. <laughs> very good, I'm gonna use that <laughs> line from now on. Right on the money. <laughs> so uh, so uh, how do you came up with the look? Uh, a lot of the look of the film originated with uh, Michelle Breton and uh, Nicola, 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 de, Cressy, Nicola yeah. de Cressy. Two artists we worked with early on. Yeah, and they had such a, an amazing line quality and sophistication to the designs and, and the, just their natural styles that, uh, that that's really where the movie kind of began with the look, combined with Alan Snow's sketches and drawings as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we, when we read the book, um, the immediate influences that we talked about were um, David Lean's Oliver Twist, um, but we also didn't want it to be located in a particular place in time. So we talked about Victorian London, but there's also other parts of Europe in the look of it. And in the end, we kind of settled on a description of it's uh, Oliver Twist as if it was starring uh, the, the actors from Monty Python and it was directed by Terry Gilliam. Mm -hmm. And everybody, everybody got that. Mm -hmm. uh, Michel Breton, okay, I understand. And he started drawing from there. And mm -hmm. that's how we ended up with this sort of uh, Baroque opera look that you're talking about. <laughs> So th this is a movie uh, which has an homage to Monty Python and, and Terry Gilliam. Uh, so how do you, do you find that special spot where it is for everybody, for every family, every children, every adult, and not try to you know, uh, alienate the audience in terms of references? Mm. 
there's not too many, there's, too, there's, there's no contemporary references, you know, pop cultural references as jokes, which a lot of animated films use and they're great and they're funny, didn't seem appropriate to this one. It felt like it was a, a movie for the whole family because at the core of Alan Snow's book is a very simple human universal story about a boy, you know, who's raised underground by monsters, who grew up underground finding his place in the world. And that's a universal story, a coming of age story that everybody can relate to. And no matter how much fantasy is in the world, um, as long as the core emotional part of the story is relatable, I think you're free to add in anything you want. What do you think that uh, each contribute to the movie in terms of unique directors? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. At this point, I feel like Tony and I are pretty much joined at the hip the way the production has evolved. It's a, it's a constant battle of production trying to sort of further split us up more to just keep uh, keep the production rolling at a double the pace, but uh, we we have so many conversations every day at the beginning and the end of the day and do so much to stay in sync with, with, with the vision of it. Um, I don't know, Tony, how would you say we Well, you're being different? modest. <laughs> Graham has his own personal films that he makes and these characters that he draws and they don't speak, uh, they don't speak in intelligible language, a lot like our hero characters, the box trolls. Mm -hmm. And uh, early on when, when Graham uh, agreed to come on the film, you said that the thing that appealed to you the most was these box troll characters. Mm -hmm. And they're so much like his personal work in his comic books and stuff, and that, that you have to understand what the characters are feeling and thinking without words. And, you know, from the very first sequences that Graham boarded, he captured that personality in the box trolls, and that's that's kind of the core of the movie and the core of the relationship between the two. So you created something of a gibberish for them, right? Yeah, there was uh, a lot of the, the language <laughs> you'd sort of developed with... Uh, yeah, D. Baker, D. Baker and Steve Bloom, yeah. two voice guys we met from, from Los Angeles. We had a description of roughly what we wanted, and then they, they sent tapes back and forth to us of this unintelligible gurgling sound that they came up with. That uh, It was a little bit inspired by... Uh, the phonetic writing that's in the book mm -hmm. and stuff, but we didn't want to write a whole new language because it began to it, it, it began to sound too much like stuff that you'd heard before. So we relied on the, the voice talent of talents of Steve Bloom and, and Dee Baker to come up with individual characters, and you could tell their emotions while they had this gurgling language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, traditional stop motion animation has been uh, very famous in England as a very school of stop motion, and also. Uh, Czechoslovakia, for example, in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah, so it, it's this, Meyer, yeah. yeah. So it, this movie is like it, uh, it's like a giving back to Europe what you learn. Yeah, um, the history of stop motion animation is is since it's such a small community of people who do stop motion animation, that and everybody knows each other, and most of the films that have been made in the last 10 or 12 years, are, a lot of those people are here working on this film. They all have a common language, you know, Jan Frankmeyer, the Brothers Quay. Um, all the Ardman films, right up through people who've worked on Nightmare Before Christmas and James and the Giant Peach, they're all sort of gathered here together because right now this is the biggest production being done uh, anywhere in stop motion. So I, I think that the biggest homage they're giving to the European uh, stop motion animation is just continuing it and moving it forward. Um, this, this film has, it takes stop motion and the way of doing it to a new level, so, mm. as I'm sure you saw in your tour of, of making the faces. But it also it integrates the CGI part of the animation to an extent that we've never done before here at Liker, and I don't think it's ever been done before on a stop motion movie. So it's, I think by continuing the, the great history of it, it is an homage. Okay, thank you very much, guys, and good luck with the movie. Great, thank Thanks. you. <laughs>